Hi and welcome to the very first video in my conversion club. In this first introductory video we're just going to be talking about the basics of conversion, what, what you absolutely need to know about conversion improvement. Notice I'm not talking about conversion optimization at the moment, I've got a bit of an issue with that term which I'll discuss with you in just a little bit. So let's look at what we're going to cover today. I'm going to talk about why conversion matters, why it's so important, why I believe in it so much. We've got to cover the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is touching absolutely every area of business. Everything I think about marketing at the moment is really kind of pointing back to this rule as being the ultimate answer to life, the universe and everything, seriously. We're going to look at what causes action. Conversion is all about generating action, getting more people to sign up, more people to buy, more people to follow, whatever it is, whatever action it is. Conversion is literally about converting people from one state when they arrive on a page to another state, a different state when they leave. So we need them to do something in order to change state from one to, to uh, the other, right? So it's going to be fill in a form, it's going to be download a white paper, it could be buy something, get their credit card out, whatever it is, requires some change in our visitor. So we're going to look at the only thing that really causes action. I'm going to tell you the absolute basic rules of conversion, what we do. We're going to look at the process of how we go about it at a very high level, and then in the next video I'll show you some real deep down and dirty uh, brass tack stuff. And then finally, because conversion improvement isn't the cure-all for every problem, I'm going to talk about a couple of the limitations of the process, which it's important to bear in mind as we proceed. But I think that once you've covered this, you will actually know a lot more than most web designers about conversion optimization and what is actually going to get more people taking more action on your websites or on your clients' websites. So let's start with why conversion matters. The absolute most basic equation that you need to know is that the success of a web page is a function of the traffic, as in how many visitors does it get, multiplied by the conversion rate. How many of those visitors take the action that you want them to take? Obviously, every page has to have a goal. If a page doesn't have a goal, if there's no action you want people to take, then the page cannot succeed. And every page should have a goal. It should actually be selling something. What's the point of putting up a web page if you don't want people to do something when they arrive? It, that may be to find some other content. It may be to click on an ad and earn you some money, right? But every page should have a conscious goal, and that's why we design a page. We design a page in order to meet one or more specific conscious goals. The percentage of visitors who actually perform that goal fill in the form, buy the product, whatever it is, that's called our conversion rate. So success is a function of traffic, the number of people who visit your page, multiplied by the conversion rate. So any increase in either traffic or conversion rate should generate more profits. Now obviously, if you've got zero traffic, then it doesn't matter how good your conversion rate is, because you're going to get zero conversions. Likewise, you can get loads of traffic, but if your conversion rate stinks and is zero, then you'll get no conversions either. So, so this is only true when there is some traffic and some conversion rate. But a conversion rate of zero would be very, very rare. You need to remember that all websites are by definition suboptimal, and this is really why I've got a problem with the term conversion rate optimization or conversion optimization which is that, in actual fact, we shouldn't be trying to optimize every single page, because that's actually very inefficient. And I'm going to talk about that later. I'm going to talk about the law of diminishing returns, which applies here. But all websites and all web pages are suboptimal, so they can all be improved. Their conversion rates can be improved to some degree. That doesn't necessarily mean we should, but there is usually good low-hanging fruit so when I come across a new website that hasn't had any optimization work done on it, I can usually 
make a few changes to boost conversion rates by literally 20 to 50 percent very often and we're talking in just a few hours work so if you haven't done any conversion work before and if you own your own websites or you manage websites for other people or you sell websites it's very likely that you will be able to achieve the same kind of results with just a little bit of information and that's what we're starting to do today now if we are in the business of improving traffic or improving conversion rate what we're really doing is we're wanting to increase the number of conversions I don't like the distinction between traffic people, like SEO people, or pay-per-click people, and conversion people. I don't believe in that. I believe that if you're a web professional, if you're a marketer, you should be conscious of traffic. You should be conscious of conversion rate, because these things also go hand in hand. And the quality of the traffic affects the conversion rate as well. It may also help to picture any page on your site or your whole website as a bucket, and you're Bucket's job is to collect visitors from one place and to transfer them to another place, right? And that's your conversion. You've taken them from one state to another state. Now, no website will do this perfectly, right? They've all got holes in. The question is, how leaky is your website or how leaky is each page? How leaky is each step in the process along your conversion funnel? If you're website has a really shockingly low conversion rate as many do then it's a very inefficient process to fill it with traffic so you're pouring traffic in the top and then if your website's leaky you're losing most of those visitors they are not proceeding to complete the actions that you want them to take you're losing most of them and that makes it very inefficient and if you're then investing time or money or resources in building traffic through organic search through SEO then most of that effort is going to be wasted if you are investing time and money in buying traffic through display ads or through pay-per-click that's even worse you're actually losing money straight out of that leaky bucket so the idea about conversion improvement is you want to plug the holes, you want to improve or, or reduce the leakiness of your website and then you can, it, it'll be a lot more efficient than any traffic that you get through whatever means will be converted more efficiently. So it doesn't make sense to be running backwards and forwards with a bucket that's full of massive holes so that when you get to the other end there's only a trickle of water left. First stop, take the time to fix the bucket and then get back to work. So, ideally, whatever investment we make, we want improvements that we get to keep. So, I believe that the best of these are conversion rate improvements. If you improve the conversion rate of your site, then any of the benefits that your site has in terms of organic reach, in terms of people who click in from other links, or direct traffic, or pay-per-click, or any way that people can come to your website all of these will be enhanced by a better conversion rate because success equals traffic multiplied by conversion rate so conversion rate I think is the best of the bunch organic it can also be really really good but it tends to be a long-term strategy content marketing is fantastic I get a lot of traffic through content marketing but content I started writing back in 2004 so it's a good long-term strategy and you can get to keep it and it can build over time, particularly if you follow the rules. So I would say that every website should be investing in conversion improvement before they invest in traffic, particularly pay-per-click, display advertising or SEO. The one proviso I would add to that is that sometimes it really makes sense to tap into some buy some pay-per-click traffic in order to test your site if you haven't got any traffic you're not going to be able to do any conversion improvement because you don't know what people are doing you need a certain number of people to visit your site in order to be able to tell what works so let's go on to the 80-20 rule 
absolutely fundamental, critical to any area of marketing. This is an example of an 80-20 curve. This is the kind of distribution. So this is, say, 50 hours that you might spend doing something, for example, and the value of those hours. Okay. What it says is that the top 20% of the input, whatever that is, top 20% of the population, top 20% of the attendees, whatever, whatever you've got, 80% of the benefits are likely to come from that. I strongly recommend if you're if you want to master this, get hold of a copy of Perry Marshall's 8020 Sales and Marketing. You will not regret it. If you buy the book and you hate it, tell me and I'll give you your money back myself. Don't worry about it. So the 8020 rule says that 80% of the benefits, right, come from the top 20% of the input. So that could be 80% of the donations that people give to a charity come from just the top 20% of the givers. The 80% of the work done by a, an organization will be done by the top 20% of the volunteers. This is a pattern that comes again and again and again. The, the top 20% of the companies on the stock exchange will have 80% of the wealth. The top 20% richest people in the country will have 80% of the wealth. Right, this pattern just comes back again. It's a law of nature. The flip side of it, of course, is that the remaining 20% of the benefits come from the other 80% of the input. So the bottom 80% do only 20% of the work or give 20% of the money or have 20% of the wealth. That means that in the job that you do, 80% of your time probably only generates, almost certainly only generates, 20% of the value. And your best 20% of your time actually produces 80% of your value. The trick, obviously, is to know which is which. And I've got webinars on that as well. What we have to learn from this, obviously, the key message is we've got to focus on that top 20%. Right? What is the top 20% that's the most valuable? What's the top 20% of our customers who pay 80% of our revenue? And obviously we've then got to minimize the bottom 80% as well. Now, how does this apply to conversion improvement? Right, what this is telling us, and I believe this is absolutely true, that most of the stuff on most web pages doesn't have a significant impact on conversion. You might also say that 80% of the things you might change are unlikely to have much impact on conversion. However, 20% of the stuff on a web page or 20% of the things you might change will have a very significant impact on conversion. The trick is to know which is which. Now, from the work that I've been doing in the first half of uh, 2013, I created a course called Ultimate Web Design. From this and the research that I've been doing, we do actually have a pretty good idea about what elements of all the stuff that you could possibly put on a web page, what elements do or can usually have the biggest impact. And I'll tell you what those are in a second. However, it isn't always clear. Right? There's always an exception to every rule. So let's look at what causes action. Right, This is my list of what we do know. Number one, content trumps style. Right, The only exception to this is if your style is completely screwed up, you know, and you've got blue text on a purple background and blinking whatever, and it's completely inappropriate for the market that you're speaking to, content matters a lot more. Right, If people can't consume your content because the style's totally messed up, then you need to fix that style obviously. But generally, what I found is in all my optimization work, uh, recently I did a an analysis where I took 30 of my recent optimization tests and I graded them to say, is was this testing style changes or was it testing content changes? And when I was testing style only, I never got more than a 9% change, 9% impact. Could be positive, could be negative. But style changes never generated a change greater in scale than 9%. When I was uh, 
testing content changes, that's a, the, the content of the message itself rather than just the style in which it was delivered, I was generally getting an impact between 10 and 20%, but sometimes 50, 100, 200% on occasion. All right, so content trumps style. We know that for a fact. Within your content, your content is made up of various core elements, and these are the ones that we think matter the most. Appeal is very, very important. What gets us to take action ever? Right, that's, that's a fundamental question of marketing and, and advertising. What makes us take action? What makes us take action is when we become convinced that doing that action is going to solve some problem that we have. Now, it doesn't have to be a severe problem, but if it's something like a headache or a bleed or a burst water main, then that, that's going to generate some urgent action. But whatever we do, we think we're going to benefit from it in some way. It makes sense to take the action. So generally what that boils down to in marketing is, I identify this problem or maybe opportunity that you have, and I'm going to promise to solve it for you. Right? If, if you take this action, then something will magically happen for you. And make it as simple as that, make it as automatic and basic and linear as that. And we call that the appeal. I promise to solve your problem, that's the appeal. We also need to give all the positive reasons why you should take action. We'll go through them one by one. Right? If you go to the prowebdesigncourse.com sales page, I literally list 25 reasons why this is the course for you. And each one is backed up with testimonials from previous students. Right? So there's the reasons and then it's reinforced with evidence and proof. You've also got to resolve all the negative reasons, the reasons why I may hold back from taking action or not take action now. And if I don't take action now, why could you think that I'm going to take action tomorrow or later on or in a month's time? Right? There is only the moment. The moment is now. If I'm not going to take action now, there's something stopping me. So that could be a doubt, it could be a fear or a concern or a kind of perceived cost. It isn't worth it for me. Handing over my information isn't worth getting your ebook. Paying $79 isn't worth the promise of this course that you're selling me. Whatever it is, right? The trade isn't going down because there are negative reasons holding me back. Or you failed to provide all the positive reasons, so I don't really perceive the benefit to me of taking the proposition that you give. Another way of looking at that is to say that we should be aiming to reverse all risk, right? For you, when I make you an offer, you shouldn't be perceiving any risk, right? I've taken all the risk away from you. One of the most common ways to do that, obviously, is to provide a guarantee. If you buy this and it doesn't work out for you, tell me and I'll give you all your money back or I'll give you 125% of your money back straight away without quibble, right? That's called risk reversal and makes a big difference to conversion rate. And then if you really boil all that down and you identify a positive reason that is emotional, that really you know gets me, that is a, addresses a problem I really do have and care about and want to solve, and you manage to reverse all the risk so that you give me no reason no reason at all not to say yes right now to this proposition. That's what we call an irresistible offer. So if you can get to that level, even better. And then finally, you've got to have a call to action. You've got to say to people, do this now, and here's how you do it. Let me show you. Right Here's where you sign. Give them the pen, point to the error on the form. This is what you do now. If you don't ask people to take action, they are unlikely to take action. If you fail to do it, in a powerful and confident and clear way, why would they believe that you believe it's right for them? Calls to action should be powerful, they should be clear, they should be simple, they should be obvious, but most of all, they should be there. So this is a really, really key list. Right? This months of work has gone into producing this list, and we're going to be coming back to this stuff again and again and again. And then finally, all of that content that constitutes the message, right, 
if it's great if it's all there, great if it's complete, but it must also fulfill four tests. It's got to be credible. I've got to be able to believe you. I've got to trust you. It's got to be relevant to me. It's got to be delivered in an appropriate way, and it's got to be interesting. If you make it really, really boring, you might just lose my attention. Okay, so it's got to be credible, relevant, appropriate, and interesting, and ideally you've got to have all the bits there as well. However, all of those things pale into insignificance in the face of the golden rule. There is one rule, I've been saying this for years, one rule for conversion improvement, and that rule is you don't know Jack. The moment you forget this rule, the moment things start getting really difficult for you. You don't know Jack. You can and should make you the most best, most educated guesses you can, but that's why we test. you got to test. Nobody actually knows until you test. There's very few things you know about the people who are going to be using this page that you want to take a certain action. One of those things is they're not you. You, you cannot expect people to respond the same way as you want them to, right? And it's a mistake to think that just wanting them to do something is enough. You've got to give them all the reasons. You've got to remove their risk, resolve their doubts and fears, and you've got to do it in a way that's interesting and appropriate and relevant and credible for them. But most of all, you've got to test different ways, and that's what we're talking about. That's what conversion's about. The best person at conversion isn't the person who has the best instincts about what's going to happen. It's the person who generates a spread of ideas and tests to see which actually works. Because your ideas ain't worth squat, and neither are mine. Right, so let's get on with some basic rules. As we've said, you've got to test the important stuff. What's the important stuff? The appeal. Is it promising to solve a problem that I actually care about? Is it worth me taking action to solve that problem? Are all the benefits in there for me? Where's the what's in it for me? Am I actually going to benefit from this? Have you resolved all my fears and doubts and concerns and risk? And have you made the cost disappear by making the value of this thing to me so much greater? Right? That's all the important stuff. And have a call to action. Right? However... At the same time, there's nearly always low-hanging fruit on every page, right? Which isn't necessarily speaking to the the core content elements, that, that the most important stuff doesn't necessarily require a big rewrite. But I've had websites where I've made a change to the strap line in the logo, right? You know, the little line next to the logo. I changed that on my own website. I got a two-figure increase in the number of people who clicked through to my course sales page. I've had a website where I changed to one of the navigation items in the in the top navigation, site-wide navigation. That also generated a two-figure increase in the number of people who filled in a form and generated a lead on that site. And the same one on a recent site, navigation change, just changing the wording from buy now to try now, also two-figure positive impact on sales, right? Changing the word buy to the word try, double figure increase in this company's profits, okay? There is very often low hanging fruit, and yes, we should be looking at the important stuff and grab the low hanging fruit as well. If the core content is wrong, this is a very technical term, if the core content ain't right, then what we're doing is we're in the business of turd polishing. And yeah, grab the low-hanging fruit, absolutely. But after that, we need to stop fiddling as well, right? If To get the core content absolutely right, right, to, to get the, the biggest win possible, you've got to go back and do market research, really understand who it is that you're talking to, what their problem is, what's going to motivate them. Right, really get under their skin if you can, and that's a lengthy and costly process to do, but it's important. That's for the absolute best results, right? So get the low-hanging fruit, then kind of stop fiddling, 
right? We don't want to just fiddle with small details. Sometimes the small details can can have a big impact following the 80-20 rule, but if you carry on, the 80-20 curve levels out and you're starting to spend a lot more time for very, very little benefit. We call that rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic or turd polishing. So for the maximum best results possible, you need to take your time, do your research, understand your market, and also work on the proposition. So when I work with clients these days, I don't just take what they give me and, and say, you know, this is who we are, this is what the product is. I tend to push back on them now and say, okay, well, what could you stand for? What could you be? You know, how can you stand out from the rest of the market? What can we say about this product that nobody else is saying? All right, big, broad strokes changes can matter a lot. So ideally, yeah, we want to swing out of the park, go for clear wins. Don't just tap and run. We want to go for the, the big wins if we can. So you can see there's a little bit of a paradox going on here. Yes, there's low-hanging fruit, right? And But what you'll probably find is the easy wins will come easily, and then you'll run out, okay? Then to get the big benefits from there, you need to go back, go deeper, right? Really reinvent and think about the core proposition. So let's look at the process. I'm just going to skim over this really right now because we're going to go into this in a lot more detail in later videos. I'm going to show you how to use the software, how to hack pages, what to think about, and you'll you'll start to kind of absorb the process through your skin really that way. But here's an overview of what we do at the highest level. First of all, you look at your bucket and identify where there are possibly holes. What could be wrong here? What's wrong about that wording? What's wrong about this headline? What's wrong about that picture or that style? Where are the possible holes? Then you get creative and say, okay, what could we do differently? What's a better headline? What's better wording? What's a better color for that form? What, you know, how can we make that stand out? How can we make that not stand out? How can we change this to be better? Using your best intelligence. Don't test crap ideas. Right? Crap in, crap out. A phrase that we use quite quite often. Right? Don't just blur, just vomit ideas into the software and expect something magical to happen. Right? Evolution doesn't work that way. Okay? It's not just random combinations of letters and random ideas. Test good ideas. Right? And if you're not a writer, bring in a writer. Bring in somebody who knows how to write. If you're not a designer, bring in someone who understands color and layout and all these kinds of things. Right? You can't test crap. If you test crap, you'll get crap results. So, you identify what may be wrong. We generate creative ideas about what might be better. We split test. And what, what that means is that we, using the, the, the software that I'll show you, the people who come to our web page will be assigned either to group A or group B, or depending how many variations you've got, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. So let's say that we've got page A and page B. Right? We've rewritten the page, we've made some changes. Half the people who come will get assigned to page A. They'll see page A. The other half the people who come will see page B. Then we measure, we tell the software to measure a specific goal. Do they buy the product? Do they download the white paper? Do they fill in the form and make contact? And then the software counts over time how many people who see A or B complete the goal that we want them to complete. And then the software knows, using some advanced mathematics that I don't understand, when a point comes when we can say, ah, oh, actually B is 90% likely to be A or it's 95% likely, or 97, and really 97% and above, we start to call that uh, statistical relevance. Right? If it's 97, particularly 99% likely to win, we, we can pretty much say that's going to win. So then what we do is we say, right, forget A, how can we improve B? So after you split test, you review the results, obviously, very important. This is the key one, learn. You look at the results, and then you say these magic words. What can we learn from these results? 
what do we know about our audience, about what they want, about what turns them on, what turns them off, what motivates them, what doesn't motivate them? What What is this test telling us? Right? We don't do this randomly. We need to learn as we go. We need to get smarter. We need to gather intelligence, not just data, as we go. And then after that, you repeat, if it's worth repeating. Now, after a while, because of the law of diminishing returns, which we'll get onto in just a second, you may find that you can't beat your control. The control is the one that you're trying to beat all the time. So you start with page A, page B beats it, right? Then the next test, you're running B against C, or B against C and D. And the winner you keep, and the losers you throw away, having learned the lessons that you need to learn. So then B becomes your control, then maybe C becomes your control, you see? So that's your process. We'll look at that in more detail in the next video. So we're going to look at two limitations of conversion improvement. The first one I've mentioned a couple of times already, it's the law of diminishing returns. You will probably find that there's low-hanging fruit and you'll get excited. Wow, we've made a 35% increase in conversions by changing a few words. Let's carry on and do that again. You'll get to a point where actually the, the big holes have been fixed and it gets a lot harder to fix the small holes. There really aren't so many big holes left to fix or obvious holes to fix. All right, so what I've done there is that I've literally taken the 80-20 curve and, and rotated it to show that initially you'll find, yes, yeah, some easy wins, big benefits, and then over time you can be putting a lot more work in but getting far fewer benefits out. It is the 80-20 curve just spun round, if you think about it. So there's the law of diminishing returns. You can't keep optimizing. That, that's why I prefer the term conversion improvement to conversion optimization, because we really shouldn't be in the business of trying to find the absolutely optimal page. There comes a point where your time or your money, whatever assets you've got, will be better spent getting more traffic to a page that's working really well than trying to get that page from being really working really well to working perfectly. Because perfect is pretty much unattainable. That long tail of that curve will go on for a long time. And you could be banging your head against the wall over time trying to get something perfect. So you know the the goal here isn't optimization. The goal here is improvement for as long as the improvement is cost effective. Here's the second one. Second limitation of conversion improvement is what I call the ice cream problem. And I use this story to illustrate it. Imagine that you have an ice cream cart and you go to the beachfront every day and you sell ice cream and you've got 16 different flavors in that cart. Then you come across a book on conversion optimization and it says, here's what we do, we split test. Right, so we test A against B and see which wins, and then we throw B away and we stick with A. Right, or, or then we test against C and we find that C is better than A, so we throw A away and we stick with C and we put all our traffic into C. And you think to yourself, ah, perhaps I could apply this to my ice cream business. So you get yourself a little chart, you make yourself a little chart, and you sit there for a week, and you record how many people buy vanilla or chocolate or banana or strawberry, right? or mint chocolate chip or raspberry ripple. And after a week, you realize actually 42% of people have bought vanilla and vanilla is the most popular. So do you then throw away your chocolate and banana and strawberry and raspberry ripple and rum and raisin and mint chocolate chip ice cream? No, that would be absolutely ridiculous. It would be foolish to do that. Why? Because vanilla may be the most popular flavor but not everybody like vanilla, okay? Now, how does that apply to optimizing conversions, increasing conversions on your web pages? Sometimes you can find an, a variation that is the best performing out of the ones you've tried, but that doesn't mean that it's the only one that you should have. And if you've read my book, Convert, then I go into a lot of detail about multiplicity, really particularly in the first half of the book. Multiplicity really says that there are different people out there with different needs. 
Right? And it can be short-sighted and foolish to think that one page can suit all of those. I'll actually add the PDF version of Convert to this page as well so that you can read it. Okay, So please read that. Understand multiplicity. Understand the ice cream problem. Okay, So really what this comes down to is conversion improvement on its own. The method that I've presented to you can be incredibly powerful, but it's limited by, in a sense, its own frame of reference. It's limited by the questions that you ask, right, or the scope that you give it. Sometimes you need to change the whole kind of style of approach, right? Not just think which home page is the best home page. Right? We've optimized this as far as we can go. Have you? Yeah? Maybe what we need is multiple landing pages to deal with multiple variations because you've got to deal with the people who do like chocolate and don't like vanilla and the people who like rum and raisin and don't like vanilla or chocolate right these people are out there so these people could all be served better by having their own ads on pay-per-click right or their own landing pages that a search engine optimized for the searches that they are typing in that reveal that they've got a different angle, slightly different variation of this problem that you're promising to solve. So you can take them, you meet them where they are, and you promise to solve their problem using their language in the particular way that they want it solved. Do you see how this works out? Okay, so that's what we've covered then today, some of the absolute basics of conversion improvement the step-by-step -step method, we've looked at the content that really, really matters. Next, I'll take you through a real-world example of how we manage this process end-to-end. -end. 